I was teaching a Bible class once in Montgomery, Alabama, many, many years ago. And I asked the question to the class, have you ever been mad at God? I'll never forget the answer of the guy. He was sitting about the third row back. He said, well, if I were, I sure wouldn't tell him. <laughs> and I thought, that'll keep it a big secret if you don't tell him. As a matter of fact, as this morning before we made this particular video, as I was leaving my house, our handyman's a good friend of ours. And, and I kiddingly said, why don't you come over and do a podcast with me? He said, what's the topic? I said, being angry with God. He said, actually, I could talk about that. And my wife was standing next to me. She said, so could I. Because I think any of us who believe that there is a God, and especially those of us who have put our faith in that God, pray to God, ask God for something, and particularly, by the way, that some people teach God, we've been angry with him because things didn't happen the way we expected them to. Now, let me talk about that just for a minute, then I'm going to introduce our guest for today. He was on the last episode of the Dr. Joe Show with me, and we got into some interesting conversation. I think this one's going to be good as well. But you understand that anger is based on pain. And so if I'm angry at God, if I'm mad at God, it's because something hurts. Now, that hurt can be because of the fact that I loved that person dearly and I begged for his life and God let him die. I re or heard I, I remember many years ago, Ted Turner saying that he had lost his faith in God because of the fact that uh, God let his sister die, even though many people had prayed for her. And Ted Turner would not be alone in that. And if you don't remember who Ted Turner is, you can look him up on Google if it even matters. Because you understand that a lot of people are like, my pain is, I begged you for this. This is what was the desire of my heart. And you told me back in Psalms that you'll give me the desire of my heart. And then this person dies. But sometimes the pain can just be based on the fact that we have been taught incorrectly about God in the sense that some televangelists, for example, might say, and I'm not saying all televangelists were bad. Uh, Charles Stanley, for example, an amazing man. But some televangelists get out there and basically say, if you just uh, send money to me, then God's going to make you rich and, and you're going to be healthy and wise. Oh, as a matter of fact, there's somebody in my audience with cancer right now. God's speaking to you, those kinds of things, and leave them to believe that that God is going to do all these wonderful things for you just because you believe. And they're teaching a very false theology. So let's ask David Matthews about that. David is my good buddy. We've been around, well, we've known each other for decades. Yes. Worked together in many ways, helping many people in many ways. A good man, a good thinker, uh, a man of true faith, and a man who is real. Because sometimes in our conversations, we get really real about what we think or feel with each other yeah. because we're not afraid of uh, our churches hearing us <laughs> and thinking, oh, my goodness, these guys are corrupt. We can be open and honest with each other. Yeah, I got it. So, David, why do people get angry with God? And, you know, I've already talked about some of the things, but what else is involved in that? Well, I think it goes back to a belief in God that everything that happens, he made happen. Right. And uh, from an abuse of a child to the death of a, a, of a spouse uh, to a disease and other people are healed and you're not. And I prayed and all that, that God seems to take the brunt of the blame. And uh, and this anger with God seems uh, unspiritual. And then people say, uh, like if somebody says, uh, my son was sexually abused to a friend, and they say, well, God won't give you more than you can handle, Joe, for example, that implies God gave it to him. Mm. And if God gave you that, then anger or at least confusion about the love of right. God is right. going to dominate your thoughts if that's your theology. That's why I wrote the book, Why Do You Hurt Me, God? Because there's a different way to look at God. And again, we don't have all the answers to these questions because God's in a different sphere than we are in. But there has to be some answers. There has to be some answers. I call it making sense of the nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. it, trying to make some sense of the nonsense. And I think we can make sense of the nonsense in some ways. And, and some questions will never be answered on this side of eternity. I, I agree with that. But sometimes, wouldn't we have a different view if we had better theology? For example, yes. that thing you just said, God won't let me have more than I can handle. Yeah. The scripture never says that. Never says it. 
and uh, everything happens for a reason is another myth. And I know some really godly people, and I always say they'll be in line in heaven ahead of me. Okay, I mean that they're really so they're godly people. people. Yeah. They're good people, but saved people, faithful people, faithful people with pure hearts, as far as I can see. Mm-hmm. Right, right, and who who say there is no coincidence. There is nothing. Everything happens for a reason. If that's the case, then the murder, the rape, murder, torture of a kid, for example, happened for a reason. My grandson died for a reason. That puts the blame on God, and and that makes it a uh, is God a monster? I think our theology sometimes has made God into a monster. And mm-hmm. may I give you one illustration, please? And I'm, I'm changing the situation to protect. The identity of the nobody that's knows this idea. person, that's, but that's I'm, safe, I'm still changing some of the yeah, situation. Not, uh, a guy okay. took uh, two of his sons out to fish one day. He drank beer all day long. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did not put life jackets on the boys. I'm going to assume this is a southerner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. and he's uh, this. Hey, big, these are my people. These yeah, are my people. Yeah, my people too. So that, you're more southern than me. You're right. Alabama. I'm Texas. So yeah. we won't yeah. go there. But anyway. Uh, he drank beer all day. One was an eight-year-old kid who actually uh, did not know how to swim. A storm came on on the lake. Mm-hmm. Uh, the father refused to take the boys in because he's catching fish. He's half drunk, maybe fully drunk. Maybe fully. And the, the boy falls in the water, and the father never gets out of the boat to save his son. And the son drowns. Was it because he was too drunk? I, I do not know. He just All you know is that he didn't. He didn't, and his wife had told us this. We knew that. They come to one of our grief retreats. And uh, again, I'm changing part of the story, but the the point is on on Saturday at the retreat, he he said before all, David, I understand why my son died. Well, I knew the backstory that he didn't jump in. He could have saved his son. Right. And you mentioned pain being under anger and all this, but he's in tremendous pain. And and pain sometimes causes us to say stupid things, right? Absolutely. And he said- distort reality. And he was not- he was not in reality, and we know why, because of his guilt. Mm-hmm. But he said, uh, God God did this because I had fallen away from God, and God wanted me to get back right with him, so praise God. Okay, that kind of theology, uh, that seems extreme, but we know why he did it. So, of course, I'm thinking, and everybody else there, number one, his wife's going to divorce him. Number two, the other son that saw his father not get out of the boat probably is going to hate God for the rest of his life unless he gets some help. Mm -hmm. Number three, uh, so God caused him not to put the life jackets on. God caused him to get drunk. God caused the storm to come. God says, I'm going to kill an eight-year-old boy in order for you to go back to church. And that kind of theology is why there's a lot of atheists in our world today. There, there are atheists that I know and love that have rejected that God, but that's not my God. My God didn't cause the storm. You say, well, God causes that. No, that's not true. He created a world in which free will he gave us in order uh, for us to experience love because God is love and love implies free will, mm-hmm. right? I have to freely choose to love God and and yes, he is ultimately to blame, not for specific acts, but for the for us having free will. And for us even existing. For us existing. Mm-hmm. And you and I talked off screen about that for a while. Yeah, in this the morning. previous episode. Yeah, in the mm-hmm. previous episode. So in a sense, it all goes back to God. But in another sense, it's not God specifically saying, I'm going to cause this, this abuse, this murder. I told you about a friend of mine who was sold into prostitution at the age of five by his own mother. God didn't want that. God didn't do that. No. But God is ultimately to blame, not for specific acts, for this world we're in because of his love, right? Debbie and I brought three children into this world, and we adopted a fourth because of our love, our love for each other, our love for God, our love for children. And, and so did you and Alice. And so we're, we're responsible for bringing them into the world. And when they hurt, we hurt. If, if, if they needed money, if, if they needed stuff and, and we needed to help them, we'll do whatever it takes to help them. But we're not responsible for what for their pain unless we bring that pain onto yeah. them. But you get that. And you can't even protect them from the pain that right. comes from life. Right. So as to the story you were just telling, I remember a few years ago, a guy was about to, to go to prison or to be convicted. And it was just before he was to leave to be incarcerated. And he held up his Bible and said, God caused this to happen so he could send me to be an evangelist in that prison. 
to which I thought, well, I hope you are an evangelist mm-hmm. in right. that prison. But you're going with because you stole. <laughs> you Sometimes stole we're you just stupid. Caught. Sometimes we are stupid. You sick. stole, you got caught, you yes. got convicted. That's why you're going to prison. Right. So if God can use you there, praise God. Yes. But he didn't have you steal no. so you could go be an evangelist in the prison. The, and the irony of the story I just told you, the very God who loves this man to this day, loves this man who did that. The comfort and the forgiveness he could have gotten from God, he has made God without knowing it into uh, a monster. Mm-hmm. The very God that he should have a relationship with that stands ready to forgive him. And his only hope is that. And our, you know, my theology is only hope is forgiveness from his God. And Amen. God s- stands ready to forgive. And I love this man. And I'm not even ripping him apart. I feel very sorry for this man, but he needs to understand he made the decision. And so if I heard what you just said, let me make sure I got this right. By making it God's fault, he actually begins to alienate himself from Eventually God. he will. And his religion will be ritual and legalistic and not relational. Okay. Whereas if he says, I was wrong. Yeah. I should have never had that beer. That right. boy should have never been on that boat right. without the, et cetera. It's my fault. Then, then he and God could become closer. He could become closer to God. God's ready to be closer to him. So David, but isn't it true that there are so many good hearted people out there who would say to a fellow in the situation, Oh, don't feel guilty. You know, you just didn't know. In other words, they're trying to make him feel better about himself. And in so doing, trying to comfort him actually caused him to move further from where the real peace can be found. Yeah. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Do you understand the point I'm trying to yeah, make? Yeah, and he's in denial. And remember, you know, in our marriage workshops, we talk about how to have peace. Everybody, he doesn't have peace. He, he's, had, he's had a false peace for a moment by denying reality. And we always say denial is not a way to peace. And, and we use denial a lot. Not and, only for ourselves, yes. but for people around us because we don't want to hurt their feelings. We don't want to feelings. hurt their feelings. No, he, he needed. But, and back to the anger issue uh, with God. What, how do you think his wife feels? Okay. She could be very angry at God for her marrying this guy. <laughs> she could be angry at God for sending the storm. She could be angry at God. She might have prayed for protection for her boys that day. Yeah. And, and so when that, things like that happen, anger comes. And what we've seen in our, our retreats, the grief retreats we do, and also in the marriage workshops, by the way, we, we see that all the time. We see people think that uh, I've had people say, oh, I've never been angry at God. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what they're really saying, and, and you can tell what they're saying. I'm not trying to read their hearts. What they're saying is, you're more spiritual if you've never <laughs> been angry at God. I, I, I've heard so many people say, oh, wow. well, you can be angry at God, Dave. But I've never been angry at God. Mm. Oh, okay. If not, wonderful. But you have to look at that and go, really? I don't think it's healthy. If, unless it's true, but I, I don't know how it could be true because everything doesn't go our way. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it's possible, wouldn't you say? I think people's personality some people are anger outs some are anger ends Mm -hmm. the anger in people might might have anger i could tell you a hundred stories about this this anger at god is an important uh i guess theme that we do need to discuss because anger with god can lead to more intimacy with god all right let's come to that in a couple of minutes okay when i left my wife uh, and children back in the mid-1980s which was forever ago and, and uh, was hoping to marry my affair partner after divorcing my wife, those kinds of things. And my affair partner went up leaving me. I went up without money. I started drinking, all those kind of things. I became an emotional atheist in the sense that I decided mm-hmm. it was no God, but it was not from logic or theology or, or science. It was right. from I didn't want the God be to there because he wasn't giving me what I wanted. And I remember once screaming at God, shaking my fist at heaven, cursing him. Why the blank, blank, did you let this blank, blank, blank? Why didn't you blank, blank, blank? Mm-hmm. No, uh, I didn't curse him to the point of blasphemy because I knew better than that. But I was doing it otherwise. And, and all of a sudden I thought, if he's not there, who am I yelling at? <laughs> <laughs> then you get mad about that. <laughs> You're yelling at nothing. <laughs> and, and it did ultimately lead to my intimacy. But 
I want you to answer our question just before okay. you deal with that. All right. How does God react to us when we get angry with him? I think he appreciates it. Okay. Scripture? Jacob wrestled with God, right? And God says to him, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And the wrestling match God had with Jacob when he's about to meet his brother, who he thinks is going to wipe him off the face he of the earth. He thought was going to kill him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's, you know, he's motivated. <laughs> yeah. and, and, of course, the blessing, uh, you know, and all that. And uh, he wrestles with God, and uh, God doesn't win the wrestling match. It's a tie. And, and I, I say in my book, by the way, God cheated. And I say that in quotes. <laughs> quote, in quote. He didn't really cheat. But he did, he did wrench the hip of Jacob, cause pain. But Jacob wouldn't let go because Jacob wanted God's blessing. I think it's a sweet story. It's a beautiful story. And then you have Habakkuk being so angry at God uh, and the book of Habakkuk has become... And by the way, that really is in your Bible. It really is. People are saying Habakkuk. Habakkuk. It's right. I, I had a friend in school that called him Habakkuk. And, and I said, well, I kind of like that, Habakkuk. I don't think that's correct. But I wasn't around when his mama named him, right? <laughs> and so any, anyway, uh, Habakkuk is yelling at God, I cry out to you and you don't listen, right? I cry out to you, you don't listen. He's so angry. And maybe anger is not the right word. Maybe it's confused, but he, mm -hmm. he's very angry. Psalm 44 is one of the, the greatest lament scriptures out there. Uh, and in fact, uh, almost 40 to 45 percent of the psalms are labeled lament psalms, which means the people are crying out to God. Why? Yeah, Psalm 73 talks about being mad at God. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this anger at God actually... I th the reason I say I think God appreciates it is because God wants a real relationship with us. Mm. And you and I deal with a lot of marriages uh, over the years, right? And control is one of the biggest issues that we deal with. Mm -hmm. And when somebody in a marriage relationship doesn't feel like they have a voice, they can never be real. Uh, they cannot express how they feel mm -hmm. and they don't feel safe. We work with marriages all the time like that, and they're on the brink of being over, right. those marriages. We know that. And it's because one doesn't have a voice often. And whenever you don't have a voice, the relationship becomes one-sided. And when the relationship is one-sided, it hurts intimacy. In fact, it kills intimacy. I agree. So this anger with God, Willard Harley, and you're familiar with him. I know you've yeah, Willard, met him. Friend. Yeah. And when he wrote this book, I think, Fall in Love, Stay in Love, or is that your book? What is, what is that? I wish it were. Yeah, that's his book. <laughs> he talks about every relationship starts, you know, like marriage starts, there has to be some intimacy involved, and then there's conflict. And if the conflict is not handled in a healthy way, a one or both withdraws emotionally from uh, the the emotional tie in the marriage to get back to intimacy. If you're in withdrawal, you have to go back through conflict. Mm -hmm. God desires a real relationship, a give and take. And you just look at Moses, look at Abraham, look at so David. How does he react then when we are angry with him? How does he react? I think he listens. What does he feel? I do not know. I think he. I think he he likes it in the sense that God's a safe place for us to share our feelings with. A but safe place. I saw that one of the scriptures you had over there yeah. was John chapter 11. I think that actually gives the answer. Yeah. Both those sisters chastised him. Chastised they did. Jesus. Chastised well, Jesus. They stabbed him in the heart by saying, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yeah. It's Lazarus your fault. Lazarus was dead. And Jesus had purposely delayed coming purposely. there until Lazarus was dead. The first sister meets him. If, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. The second sister, same thing. Yeah. And, and instead of him going, how dare you question me? <laughs> which is how I think for a long time I thought God would have responded. Yeah. What did he do? <laughs> His heart went out to them and he raised Lazarus from the dead. He saw their pain. And he wept. He wept. He cried with them. When they were angry at him, he didn't get mad at them. He felt their pain and cried with them. 
Let's just say it this way. I've told this to many people. I, too, I believe it to be true. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. God's a big boy. He doesn't get shook up when you get mad at him. No. He can take care of himself. All right. So if God then is not getting angry with us because we get angry with him, how does it, because we're running out of time, how does it lead to intimacy? It leads to intimacy because uh, let's just take Habakkuk. Let's just stay there. See, people are still trying to find that in their Bible. Yeah, well, you'll know, I, to this day, I have to look it up in the table of contents. All right. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you don't answer? Or cry out to you violence, but you don't save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? So he's angry mm-hmm. because the enemy's coming, and God's going to use the enemy to discipline God's people. Mm-hmm. And the enemy's worse than God's people. Mm-hmm. So Habakkuk doesn't get it. And, and, and God says, just hold on, hold on. And if you read God's response to Habakkuk, he's very gentle and very, very unique. And, and, but not to God, it's not unique. He likes it. He likes it in the sense that now he's, look, I don't get mad at nothing. You said you yelled at God. And if God doesn't exist, no, that proves that God does exist because he listens. And so in, in Habakkuk, he says, Habakkuk, I'm going to do some things in your day that you'd be amazed. You wouldn't even believe me if I told you, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up the, the evil people to discipline uh, my people. And then Habakkuk comes back and doesn't like the answer, right? Mm-hmm. He comes back. He oh, doesn't God, like the answer. You can't do it that yeah, way. Yes. How dare you do it that way? <laughs> yeah. And then God says, get your iPad out. He said, yeah, get your <laughs> iPad out. Get your device out. Take notes and like a herald, run with this message. The day is coming that everything's going to be made right. So at the end of Habakkuk, this is how it leads to intimacy. Habakkuk's had his say with God. God has not condemned him. God has been bold with him saying, okay, write this down because this is going to happen. And you need to listen to this and then take it to other people. And so at the end of Habakkuk, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound as the horses are coming and and the enemy's coming. Decay crept into my bones. My legs trembled. He's afraid. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's all right to be afraid. Sure it is. It's all right to not like God's decisions. It's all right to tell God that. But in the final analysis, God is there listening, and he wraps you in his arms. And here's what he said. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us because I know God's just. And then he says, though the fig tree does not bud, though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, everything's gone. (laughs) This gets me every time. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. In my understanding of going to the heights in the Old Testament, the higher you go, the closer you get to God. Mm. I think what he's saying and what, what all the commentators I've read on this is saying, you go to the heights to meet God with all your junk, your anger, uh, your confusion, your fears, uh, you don't like, I didn't like that my grandson died. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it. It's okay for me not to like it. It's okay for my son and daughter-in-law not to like it. It's okay to be real with God. And once we're real with him, we find out that God hasn't left us at all. Mm-hmm. He's still there. And that's what Habakkuk found. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. I can take all my stuff to the heights and there God will greet me as he greeted the adulterous woman in John 8 Mm -hmm. and the woman at the well in John 4, they were pretty real with him. The the woman at the, uh, at the well was, was feisty. She was feisty. Oh yeah, she was. But God, that's why she had already had five husbands. (laughs) Exactly. And given up on marriage, (laughs) she had given up on marriage. She's living with this guy. But here's Jesus talking to her at the well and, and it went against all the norms of the day. Right. Uh, and he, you know, it's wrong for a Samaritan or a Jew to drink after, you know, with yeah, a Samaritan. Right. It's even wrong, wrong in their culture, in a sense, not sinful, that he's talking to a woman alone, mm-hmm. right? Like that. And then, uh, but he loved on her and it changed her whole life. So being real with God and my emotions, God knows it anyway, as you said, leads to in- intimacy because God doesn't run away. Mm-hmm. You tried to run away from God. Mm-hmm. I didn't do the Joe Bean thing, but I 
I'm no better than Joe Beam. I wanted to run away from God often. And every time I ran away from him, I ran smack back, dab right back into his outstretched arms. Being honest with God about your emotions leads to deep intimacy. That's what intimacy is all about. Yeah. Openness, transparency. Yes. Now, just for those who might be questioning one thing David said earlier mm-hmm. that I agreed with when he said, it's, it's okay to be afraid. Some of you are going, no, oh, wait a minute. Faith and fear, those fear are not. opposites. Fear not. Fear not. Not. We're not saying that you should live in fear. As a matter of fact, no. that's a miserable place to live. Yes. And, and faith can and will overcome fear. But you have to accept the fact that God sees us as we are. One of the cool things about Jesus becoming one of us well, so he could experience all these emotions. And he was afraid. Before he went to the to the cross, he was Absolutely. in the Garden of Eden. You think he was honest with God? Take this cup from me? Hey, don't make me do this. Un- unless there's no other way, don't make me do this. And he was sweating blood, which medically is a sign of high pressure, Anxiety. blood pressure, tension. So even he was afraid. And so it's okay to be afraid. Just don't let the fear run your life. So let's kind of recap up until now. The devil... I'm recapping a whole bunch of weeks yeah, here, David. Yeah. The devil exists. He and his army do their things. And we should understand that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he devour, and he is on this earth. There are things that he will do to hurt us, sometimes because it, it's an opportunity to try to mess up the plans of God. Paul would say, if the, evil, if the, if the rulers of this age had understood what they were doing in crucifying Jesus, they wouldn't have done it. They thought, we're messing up God's plans. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they do the bad things because they think they're messing up God's plans. Other times they do it just because they like to see God's children suffer. As a matter of fact, they like to see everybody suffer because ultimately they will suffer. Some are already in chains of darkness in hell. Some are not yet. And so they want us to suffer because they suffer. Now, into the topic for the last couple of weeks then. So why isn't God protecting us from all these terrible things that are happening around us? And as David has pointed out, God, say it again, God is in the moment. Explain one more time what that means. God responds in the moment. All the way through Scripture, he responds in the moment. And his, his heart goes out to us as we're going through this. He, he is there responding. Uh, everything's not all set that uh, somebody's going to hurt me next Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon uh, with God. It, it's, it's different than that. I, and I can't explain it any better because there's still unanswered yeah. questions. As I have said many yeah. times, if I can completely understand and explain God, he wouldn't be much of a God. He would be a human invention. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is good that we do not understand God completely. Mm -hmm. Because somebody understands how we got to the moon and watched Neil Armstrong. Somebody understands our iPhone and how that works, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was created by human beings. Uh, So if you could explain everything about God, God would not exist. Exactly. I would agree. He would not exist. But but he is there. By the way, can I say this? Please. If you reject God because of unanswered questions, you too must reject atheism because of unanswered questions and agnosticism because of unanswered questions. If you were being logical. Yes. But it, typically rejecting God is not logical. It's right, emotional. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So David's book, Why Do You Hurt Me, God? You can get it at Spark of Life. Dot org, or you can also buy it on Amazon. I love the subtitle, Discovering God in Life in the Midst of Pain. God is always there, and he loves and he cares. And if you go back and read in Job again, he made it very clear. Job did. Look, <laughs> when I finally have my total peace is when I'm out of this body. Yes. And, and we believe, David and I believe, and, I, and many of you probably believe if you're watching this, that there's another life. This is not the end of it. And there might be a lot of misery in this life because of the fact that pain exists. Some because of the fact that we bring it on ourselves. We do the things we shouldn't be doing. Pain exists because there are evil people on this mm-hmm. planet. Pain exists for all kinds of reasons. But if we had time, we'd look at the passages where that we're told, like, is it Peter who says that that pain, if we endure it, actually becomes a blessing to us. And maybe that's a little bit later we'll talk mm-hmm. about that. So, David, if people right now are saying, I'm mad at God, I think you would agree with me when we say that he's a big boy. He can take it. He can take it. 
Tell him about it. Yeah, explain it to him. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. I mean, not just in, oh, Lord, and use all that holy church language. No. Get on your face or your knees and just tell him what you feel. He'll get mad at me. Look, we've shown you the passages, Habakkuk, John 11, etc. He wants to hear what you feel. He wants to be close to you. And another thing we don't have time to talk about now is that there are other people who work for God like you do. Yes, and I was about to say that, giving voice to my pain, not only to God, but it's still to God if I give voice to my pain to Dr. Joe Beam or Dave Matthews, our friend. And that's can comfort and love you and, and, without coddling you and saying, it's not your fault. Right. Because sometimes it is. Sometimes so David, tell about this retreat workshop you do. Uh, with Spark of Life, we do grief retreats uh, online and in, in, in person. Uh, at various parts all around the country. It's three and a half days, and it's a safe place. That's what makes them so successful in the sense that uh, people always say they get help coming to a retreat. And, and why would they come to your retreat? What's because of loss, of any kind of loss, from death losses are pretty obvious, but non-death losses. Divorce is a huge, huge loss. Uh, uh, retirement is a loss. Uh, having a hand, handicapped child could be a loss. Uh, having a handicapped that's child can be it is a loss. What about a child that no longer wants anything to do with you? Well, that's a huge loss as well. And we see that at our retreats. And oftentimes people don't uh, label things as, as a grief situation because they don't look at it as a loss. Uh, a loss could be I, I intentionally sell my house and move somewhere else or get a new job. That could be a loss of a familiar pattern of behavior. So many different kinds of losses, and all losses are in context, right? The, the, the way I handle my present big loss might go all the way back to my childhood, mm -hmm. uh, can affect it. And so that's what we do at a three-and-a-half-day retreat. We eat well. We, 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 we get bring very close. You bring your own chefs, don't you? Yes, yes. In some places, we bring our own chef. Okay, and so you lead people through examining process, their pain. Yes, examining their pain. We give them specific specific strategies to use uh, because that's so important for somebody who's deep in grief to get up in the morning and say, this is what I need to do today. Specific, simple strategies. And we, we equip them, we encourage them, we empower them. We believe you own your own gr recovery uh, from your losses and we empower you to do that. And, and we give you strategies to do it. So we, we, we equip, we encourage, we empower at a retreat. And to have well, a lady who went to your retreat, I know that yeah. because she's a mutual friend, went to your retreat because her husband had died from blood cancer. After a while, after healing and those kinds of things, she, uh, she married another guy and has just discovered that he now has blood cancer, same disease that killed her first husband. Now, and she's questioning and she actually posted a question on Facebook the other day. You know, why God would you let the uh -huh. same thing happen to me twice? And so we've been answering by saying we don't, we can't speak for God. And those guys in the book of Job who spoke for God messed up. They messed up. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. No, and God got <laughs> mad at them because they said, it's all your fault. You're a sinner. Now, if you do sin, we'll tell people, you know, you got to stop that. If, if you're having trouble with your lungs and saying, boy, God needs to heal me, and you're still smoking four packs of cigarettes a day, we're going to point out to you that you've got some responsibility in this. So here's the pain all over again. Can you retreat help her a second time? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, it's like the marriage workshops. We've had people come back and they say, man, you've changed half of it. Mm -hmm. Grievers, by the very nature of what they're going through, have short attention spans. Mm -hmm. And so it helps tremendously to come back. I hope she does come back to one of our retreats. I think I remember her. But yeah, you know who it is. Yeah. And so God cares. Yeah. He doesn't get mad at you if you get mad at him. And we beg you, talk to him. Yeah. Tell him what you really think or feel. But you need to, as you were saying at the end, you need to find somebody who cares. Hopefully somebody who is spiritually mature, not somebody who's going to say, well, if you just do this, then everything is better tomorrow because that's not mature. That's not reality. But somebody who can listen with you, who can cry with you, who can laugh with you, who can spend time with you. And David, any suggestions on how they can find a person like that? Yeah, they can go online, sparkalife.org, and 
And you have people like we that. We have coaches that have been through horrific losses from losing three children, one couple to a multitude of losses who care about people. And that, that's what they want to do. Use what they've learned through their losses to help others, to comfort others with the comfort so we not, have received. Not just your workshops. You have yep. coaches that can be yes. there for yes. them right. by, by phone or, or right. uh, Zoom or whatever, I guess. And we do grief workshops for churches to help people. Oh, well, you'll come to a church and do that. Oh, yeah. We've done 85, about 85 grief workshops for churches over the last 13 years. And people can find out about that at Spark. Sp- of life.org. Now, David will be back on me more with me more as we go into the future. I like the way he thinks. I like the way he looks at life in reality. We were trying not to be theologians. We're trying to be people that say, this is how the book, the Bible applies to real life. And David and his wife, Debbie, also work with us at Marriage Helper, MH International. They have been leading workshops for marriages in crisis for 18 years. 18 years. They started when they were four. They've been doing it for 18, 18 years. years. And and it's a so, joy. It, it's a joy. So if you ever come to one of our workshops, you might well meet David and his wife there as they lead those. We have a lot more to talk about under this spiritual warfare. Uh, David, thank you You're for welcome. spending two episodes with me. I mm-hmm. appreciate it so deeply. Yeah. Go to the thedrjoeshow.co. It's the... The H-E, doctor, just the D-R, but without the period, the Show.co, and you can post questions there. And when we're heading those up, we're looking for those. We encourage you to share. Ask your friends to watch these and to subscribe if you, if you possibly can and help us get the message out there because we want to give a message that God is and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that there is hope. Even when it appears there is not enough. Anything else you'd like to say, my friend? Thank you. You know, I love you. I love you. And I love what you do. And uh, we just hope this helps. I love his wife. I even love his dog. (laughs) I really do. (laughs) Okay. Have a great day. Hey, and open your Bible.